Good morning. Today I'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. As for you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were born by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We'll see if it comes. Okay. I can hear myself talking up here, but you can't hear me talking out there. So we'll see what we can do with that. Exciting week this week. LTC is going to be happening this week, and so we're excited about that. Kids have been preparing. They're all set. They're all ready to go win all the best prizes for everything. So that's going to be a great time. I'm not on, am I? <laughs> all right. I don't know if that one's on or this one's on, so I don't know whether to walk away or not. All right. So that's going to be an exciting thing coming up. And uh, I know if you've got kids, you're, you're really going to be proud of your children and all the good things that they do. We want to try something different with cards and, and things like that. You know, announcements are always awkward. And uh, we try and make them more awkward if possible. So that's usually our way of doing things. We have been having you, if you had any prayer requests, write them on the back. And I'm not sure everybody wants all of those announced. And so we're going to come up with a different plan, see if this will work for you. Um, go ahead and write stuff on the back of the card. Put it in the collection plate, no problem. We will send it out on Monday as an email so that everyone who has that is able to pray. And that way you can let everybody know prayers will be said. If you want it announced this morning, come forward with your card. So if you write it, we'll write it. If you come forward and say it, we'll say it. How's that? Is that easy to remember? And I think it will help if, if you know, you need that support that you come up and, and go ahead and write it out and hand it to somebody because that's just easier to read. But then just stay up and let us pray with you and the elders will come and they will pray and it lets other people know so that they're able to have encouragement for you. And so see if that works. See if you can remember. I know you already passed in cards this week. But uh, if you would like prayers today, just go ahead and, and come up and talk to the elders after the sermon. So, relationships and the cross. I don't know how you grew up. Did you have a happy childhood? Everything was good. Your parents were wonderful. Everybody was nice to you. You, everything went so well in your life. You made all A's in school. You won at all the sports you ever played. Uh, everything was just perfect in your life. And so, if that's you, I am so happy that you had that. Because you have since experienced the rest of the world. And a lot of people did not grow up with that. And they grew up more with angry people, and they grew up more with selfish people, and they grew up more with people who were out for themselves and may have considered them, but they were not the primary concern. And so if they were around, that was okay, but, you know, nobody ever really paid attention. And some people... They saw angry attitudes and selfishness and people taking advantage and all kinds of problems that came through. Some were not even loving. Some were cruel. Some didn't know how to love. And I think we've all grown up at different times with different things, and yet somehow we all made it here. And what a great thing it is to be able to have these kind of relationships, and it's all because of the cross of Jesus. And I want to talk a little bit today about how all that happens. 
So did you ever wish you had Adam and Eve as your parents? Wouldn't that be great? I, I, it might be weird, right? Did you ever think about that? So they had known about this great garden. They didn't have any other kids. No bad things had happened to them in their childhood. They hadn't even had a childhood. So how would they even know what you're going through? But here they talk about this garden and they talk about the place where it was and they talk about how perfect it was and about how great God was back then. Kind of similar to where you are now because they all talk about how great it used to be back then. For some reason we keep that kind of scenario in the good old days, right? Which we find out we're not all that good. But anyway, the conversation might be about how you got thrown out of the garden. That would be a tough family to be in. One of the boys died, and that's always hard on a family. And actually, the other boy's the killer. And that's always hard on a family if you have a killer in your midst. That would make some from really tense family dinners, wouldn't it? Sometimes we don't start in a good place. And I hope you did. I hope you had this great family and this great loving kindness that was in your life. But not everybody starts there. And I think certainly we don't all end up there. And so the passage that we read this morning, Ephesians 2, while you were dead in your trespasses and your sins talks about some pretty difficult times, some pretty hard times. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and it wasn't even all us. There's other forces in the world that are going on. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit of disobedience, the course of the world. And you get the very distinct sense that there's a whole lot of other things that have conspired here to make this not a good place. People living in the passions of flesh and desires where it's all about me and it's none about you. Every person is a child of wrath. Wow. You may have thought that about your brothers and sisters, right? They were children of wrath because they're angry all the time. Or were they nice? Were they good? But what if they were all angry all the time? The only response you ever get is anger. And the first thing that they ever thought about was anger. And all relationships were bad because of how we lived and because of what had happened. And it says this is like the rest of mankind. This is how the world gets to be. And what a sad place it is. And it may be we started there, or it may be we experienced this along the way, but we run into evil in our world, don't we? There's no way to protect everybody. There's no way to keep them out of the world so that there's nothing that's evil ever going to touch them. In fact, that isn't the plan. The plan is to let you see all of this. And to realize that there is something better, that there is something so much more than this. And so when we realized all of that, then God, being rich in mercy and the love with which he loved us, even when we were sinners, even when we were desperate, he made us alive with Christ. And the cross is about the first part of that. It talks about how we had gotten ourselves to this point where things were really bad that we were not following the good path, that we were following a bad path. And I'm amazed as I was looking through Scripture how many times this is mentioned. This is just in the first part of the chapter. If you skip down to verse 11, same chapter even. Therefore remember that one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I'm always so glad for that last phrase. 
He says that, you know, the circumcision was basically the seal of the covenant of, with the covenant of Moses that God had given to his people. His people, not us. Because we're living in America, and uh, chances are very few of you would have ever been included in that. I wouldn't have been included in that. I would have been one of the guys on the other side. I would have been one of the guys who isn't part of that. I didn't get those Ten Commandments. I would not have been the ones who was chosen by God. I would have been ones on the other side who has no promise, no Messiah, no blessing, separated from anything Israel would have gotten, strangers to any kind of covenant, have no promise from God whatsoever, no hope without God in a world that has left God out. That's not a very good picture, is it? That's pretty difficult to deal with that, but that's what he's saying to us. I want you to realize that's where we are. are. We are the people who didn't get that chosen blessing where it was all descended from one from another. We had no access to the dealings of God, no history of a garden, no ark, no promise to generations. In fact, we were... If you know the story, we were Cain's sons. Really? We had a history of a failed garden. We had a history of a killer. Because that's where we descended from. And that's what our family was like. And we just tried to overcome that. We were alienated strangers, no hope without God. Because we were all descended from Cain. I mean, it starts with Adam and Eve. They have two sons, Cain and Abel, and Abel dies. So guess where the rest of us came from? There's only one choice. Cain's sons. But now in Christ, there's a cross. But since the beginning, we were Cain's. We had no hope. There were no Abel kids. You realize that? There are no descendants of Abel those genealogies that we see, uh, there is going to be another son, but uh, all grandchildren were grandchildren of Cain. When you go to watch the grandchildren, those are the ones you're going to be watching. They grew up in Cain's household. They grew up with the angry one, the guy who can't hold his temper, the guy who would even kill his own brother. What do you think he did with his kids? And that's your grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. It's a bad house to grow up in. It's not a pleasant thing at all. In fact, when you start looking at the genealogy and all the different people, Lamech was Cain's great-great-grandson. And you'll recall how Cain was given a mark. And Cain was worried about that mark. He says, no, if somebody sees me, they're going to kill me. He says, no, I'll do seven times to them because I'm not going to have anyone punish you. Well, Lamech knew about that, and he wrote this in Genesis 4, 23. Lamech said to his wives, Alda and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. That's a good house to grow up in, right? Wow. That's a threat. He says, you think my father was bad, my grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, you haven't seen anything yet as far as cruelty is concerned and what I am able to do. The world is not always a good place, is it? And there are some really horrible things that goes on. The level of violence is huge. Is it any wonder that, you know, there's kind of a gap in there? You see Cain and Abel growing up, and there's kind of a gap before anything else. Would you be afraid to have kids? I mean, the one I've got left is Cain. What if we have another one like him? Not sure I want to. But they do. 
In Genesis 4:25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. For Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's just a scary passage in itself, isn't it? Even though it's announcing something good, there's going to be another son. There's going to be a grandson named Enish. Of course, by this time, Cain has already grown and maybe has kids and, and all of this. And so there's going to be Seth, but the tension that goes on in that family of, you know, they blame the, the child because Cain killed him, we need to have another one. And I don't think there's a day that that ever goes away. You don't remember that as being part of your family. And Seth was born, and then his grandson, his son named Enish. And then finally, people begin to call on the name of the Lord. Because that gap between the garden and the beautiful place and how great it was and the time between the grandson of Seth, there is not much good news. People did everything they could. What do you do with a world like that? How do you solve anything like that? It's amazing to look at that. How do we deal with such evil? Well, that's kind of why we're here, isn't it? It's what it's all about. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that the one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is so huge in the light of all of the devastation and all the destruction and all the anger and all the hatred that went on in the world. And it wasn't very far after the garden. I mean, it's right there, one generation away. It didn't take a long time for us to go bad. And maybe you've got people in your family. I think every family's just given one. You know, the bad seed, the black sheep. Almost every family I know has got, well, yeah, that's the black sheep. We all know that. We all know who it is, and we can all, and maybe it's you. So I'm glad you're here. But sometimes we get things like that, and and we all know that this is so bad. Well, what do you do with this? How do you deal with this? And that's what you see in this passage about how God deals with this. I mean, first he says the love of Christ controls us or compels us because Christ died for us. And so we also respond to that. We don't want to live in that way. We are going to die to that old self. We're going to live a different life. We're going to live a different way. We've decided I don't want to live that way because I'm going to let his love be the thing that I respond to. I'm not going to respond to all of the hatred and say, yeah, let me keep all this hatred. I want to respond and live for Christ who died and was raised. In Christ, there's a new creation, a new creature, a new person. 
Old things have passed away, new things have come, and what a great message that is for all of us that we didn't have to stay in that kind of a world, that new things are able to come because old things have passed away and it's all done through Christ, it's all done through his death. This is what it's all about, is that you know, his love controls us, there's a new creation. And finally he says, we are all reconciled to God. God has given us this ministry of restoring relationships, and that's what it's really about. I mean, we don't really talk about reconcile, do we? I mean, unless there's been a major split and a couple has reconciled, we say maybe they got back together, something like that. It's about building more relationships. And that's what he's really trying to say. You had all this horror and all these terrible things and all these awful things that went on, and now you've been able to get past it all, and there's a way to build relationships. And he gave you the ministry of trying to talk to people about their relationship with God and about saying you can have a better relationship. And there's a reason you can have a better relationship. And the reason you can have that better relationship is all because of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be stuck with the old one. Did you ever wish that friends were better friends? And that somehow you knew people more? Or that you could have this connection with them and you just don't seem to have any way to get there? You see them, you kind of know them, but... Sometimes we've messed up things there too. How do you build those relationships? And God says, I'm going to give you a way to be able to build those kind of relationships with me. I'm going to do it because I sent my son. And the last verse of the passage we read is just so huge. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Wow. God made him to be sin. It comes down to this one thing. No one could be good enough. So God made someone bad enough. Does that make sense? It isn't done because someone was righteous. It's done because someone was evil. That's real power in it all. Jesus was righteous. Jesus was good. Jesus had the same difficulties all the rest of us have growing up. And he was perfect. No sin whatsoever at all. And it's still not enough to get you into heaven because you know him and he'll vouch for you. The only thing that gets you into heaven is he became the absolute horror of the world. He became bad enough. Wow. He became Cain's son. He became Lamech's son. He became the guy with all of the abuse and all of the things that have been done to him. All of the failure of all of the people for all time was on him. He's blamed for it all. He is at the bottom. He is the worst of the worst. He is all the sins of every idolater and every problem and every person He took all the sins of every single person, all the violence of the world of Noah, all the rape, all the incest, all the stealing, all the murder, all the beating, that we might become the righteousness of God. God made the worst horror film you've ever seen and did it to his own son. And the cross is the turning point for it all. Some people refuse to give up their own sins. They're mine, I like them. I'm used to them by now, right? You just have to accept me like I am. That's our way of saying, I'm not gonna try to be any better. 
I'm not going to try to improve. You just have to accept me like I am. And uh, we think we can pay for our own sins. We'll just survive. No new creation, no blessing, no trying to be better on our own. And it really doesn't get us anywhere. I want you to look at what Jesus did. In 1 Peter chapter 2, as you look at the passage in, that Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 21, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving for you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. For you were all straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd in the overseer of your souls. You have been called to this. You have been given opportunity. You have been given chance. You don't have to stay in all of those horrible, bad relationships. You have a chance to make all of them better. You have a chance especially to make the one with God better because Christ is the example. We follow in his steps. He didn't sin. There was no deceit, none whatsoever. He didn't revile back. He didn't say any bad things at all about the people who were crucifying him. He didn't threaten. Could have called 10,000 angels. It's actually 72,000 if you know what a legion is. And he didn't threaten at all. The passage says he trusted God. He trusted himself to God so that we could die to sin and live to righteousness. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. And by his wounds, you are healed. What if you went to the pharmacy to get a prescription filled and said, well, you know, I've got a headache. I need an aspirin, so I'll go get my prescription filled and I'll get the aspirin. And okay, well, it's not aspirin today. Actually, the best remedy that we can get for this is to break your nose. You might say, well, that doesn't sound like a right thing. You know, I'm already hurt and I'm already wounded. No, that's what we have to do. We have to break your nose. Or if you go with a worse disease, well, that's a broken arm. Or that's a whip. Or that's a lash. And everything you went and said, I have this problem. I have this hurt. I have this pain in my, in my life. And they said, tell you what, we're going to do violence to you to make it better. And you would have said, no. That's not how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to give me something that makes me feel good. And the pharmacist would say, you don't understand the problem. You already did that. And there's a reason why you've got it, and here's the price for it. But just for today, we'll break somebody else's nose. We've got a guy in the back, and he'll do it for you. Just for today, we'll break somebody else's arm. Just for today, we will, and all of the violence and horror that would equal out what we have done was done to Jesus. By his wounds, you are healed. The good news is we've got somebody else to do it. And we have one who didn't retaliate. He just took it. And he got up. And he went back to heaven. And he said we could come too. 
How incredible that is. That we could die to our old self and we could be raised with him. And we could get rid of all of it. All of the caneness that was in us, all this anger and all these other things and all these other problems and all this other violence that had to be done because of our violence. The love of God said, I'll take all of that and just allow you to come with me, if you will. Romans 6, he says, How, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Think, oh, well, we get, just get better grace, right? I mean, it's okay, we can sin because after all, Jesus died. He says, no, please don't. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so we too might walk in newness of life what an incredible thing it is it's not just hoping for more grace it's not just hoping Jesus doesn't come back today and that the world doesn't end today it's not just hoping that no one notices all the things that we've got wrong with us it's not just hoping and trying to pretend that there are no angry people in the world. After all, everything's fine. Everything's wonderful. As long as we avoid some of them, then maybe they avoid us. That's what baptism means. We are baptized into his death. I'm so glad he made it water instead of dirt. It's being six feet under, and we'll dig you up again in just a minute. Is just a whole different scenario. And we go into a grave with him because we believe in him that he did this. And he comes out clean, and we come out clean. And he goes to heaven, and we say, We'll see you there soon because we don't have that much longer. And we can walk in a new life. I don't know where you are, but God designed baptism to be able to look like this entrance into a new life. Where it's like being buried. And it's the easiest possible thing. You just go into the water and it takes away all sin because the blood of Jesus is there to cleanse you from everything. And we're raised to walk a new life. We're raised to be new people. We're raised to be sons and daughters of God, not sons and daughters of Cain. Not people who had no promise, but now people who have a great promise because Jesus has died. And he said, I want you to come too. So what's your response today? Do you believe in him? Are you there with him? If you need to be baptized into Christ, let's do it now. What a great thing. I am so looking forward to next week's sermon after this week's sermon because we're going to talk about resurrection. We have all been lifted up. We all are able to walk in newness of life because of the glory of the Father. Would you come while we stand and sing?